All right. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to March. It's the March version of the JBS Online Journal Club. We're excited to have everybody here today. Um, we are extremely excited to present two uh, very diverse articles. Um, we are presenting the mortality analysis of endovascular aneurysm sealing versus endovascular aneurysm repair, and also venous stent patency uh, is independent of total stented length in non-thrombotic iliac vein and post-thrombotic venous stenosis. Our two host institutions this evening are Duke, um, Dr. Young Kim, who is an assistant professor of surgery um, at Duke University, and then Dr. Hope Weisler, who is their third year integrated resident. Dr. Charlie Briggs, who is an associate professor, or sorry, uh, is associate program director um, of the Vascular Lab Fellowship at Atrium Health with his uh, first year fellow, Dr. Dan, or Dale Coffey. We have our two author guests this evening, Dr. Mark Schimmerhorn, who is the chief of vascular and endovascular surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess. And then joining us from the Netherlands at a ungodly time of the day is uh, Dr. Restogi, who is a research fellow and who is a surgical resident in Rotterdam. Dr. Patrick Muck, um, who is the chief of vascular at Good Samaritan Hospital, is also joining us from the Venus article and his co-author, Dr. Brent Robertson, who's a vascular surgeon at Jersey Coast Vascular Institute. We potentially have Dr. Tad Ra Todd Rasmussen as a special guest. Um, he is dealing with an emergency and he said he may be running a little bit late, but he will be one of the moderate, he'll be the moderator for the endovascular aneurysm repair. And we're thrilled to have Dr. Anahita Dua, who is an associate professor of surgery at Mass General to discuss the Venus article. Just a few housekeeping um, things. We ask you to please stay muted during the uh, presentations. Um, we will potentially call on you, but you can always put your comments or questions in the chat and our moderators will, um, will uh, bring those up. The event is being recorded for on-demand access and then April JBS Online Journal Club will be April 12th. It's at 7 p.m. Eastern and it'll be hosted by uh, Loyola University and the University of Indiana. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I, be I believe that um, Dr. Kim, you're gonna take it away from here. Yep, pull up my screen now. Can everybody see that okay here? That looks great. All right, excellent. Um, thank you, Misty and Paul, for inviting us to um, present at um, the March Journal Club. I'm uh, joining here from uh, Durham, and I'm joined by our senior resident, Dr. Hope Weisler, who will be presenting an article comparing outcomes between EVAR and EVAS from the Beth Israel Group. Um, we have no uh, financial disclosures, but I do think it's worth mentioning for the discussion that the Nelix uh, system is a product of Endologics. Um, for a quick background, um, we all know EVAR was first performed in 1990 by Dr. Parodi and gradually adapted through the 90s and 2000s in the United States. Um, some of the concerns with EVAR include long-term durability and endo leaks, and the heavy heading uh, randomized control trials have reported re-intervention rates ranging anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. Um, there have also been concerned that a pressurized aneurysm sac itself may be inflammatory in nature. And Dr. O'Donnell has recently shown that sac regression is associated with higher survival rates independent of endo leaks or reinterventions. And this is where the EVIS device comes in. The concept behind the EVIS is to completely stabilize and seal the aneurysm sac through polymer filled endo bags. And in theory, this should result in a depressurized aneurysm sac and lower incidence of endo leaks. Um, the EVIS was trademarked in 2013 and underwent its first IDE trial between 2014 to 2016. Um, looking at the device itself, it's composed of uh, two PTFE covered uh, cobalt chromium stents, um, which go all the way up to the level of the renals. These are balloon expandable, as opposed to other uh, self-expanding stent graft devices. And after you expand the stents, the endo bags are filled with um, Poly, uh, polyethylene glycol-based polymer, which takes a few minutes to set in, kind of like the Alta device. 
And I just wanted to point out here, um, there is no active fixation, which may be important in uh, the discussion of long-term outcomes. Um, uh, these uh, stents go through a 17 French bilaterally, um, the aortic neck and distal iliac criteria are similar to other EVAR devices. Now, where the Nelix di differs from EVAR is that it requires an inner lumen diameter of less than seven centimeters and an outer wall to inner lumen diameter ratio should be less than about 1.4. And um, finally, it's not presently indicated for rupture or uh, for patients with uh, end-stage renal or creatinine greater than two, um, which compromises a significant proportion of our patients down here in the South. Um, with regard to long-term outcomes, there are some concerns as published in the European Journal, including graft failure, type 1a endoleaks, um, and caudal stent migration, uh, which may or may not be related to the reliance on passive fixation. Um, so in 2019, Endologics voluntarily recalled their inventory, citing um, concerns of use outside of the IFU. Um, that being said, the underlying concept of SAC obliteration uh, remains an interesting one. And um, uh, according to the article, there was a second ID trial undergoing, but um, there are reports after speaking with some reps that this um, uh, second trial may be shut down, which ultimately brings us to today's article. Um, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to um, uh, Dr. Weisler. Uh, Dr. Kim, I cannot share. Oh, there we go. Are you all seeing those slides okay? We are. Great. So um, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Kim, and uh, let's get down to the article. So um, this article uh, by Rastogi and colleagues is centered around the concept of active aneurysm sac management in the setting of ongoing concerns about the durability of EVAR as previously stated in the longer term, as well as, again, some concerns about the negative cardiovascular effects of ongoing sac perfusion, potentially leading to increased inflammation. As overviewed by Dr. Kim, the format of active sac management of interest in this particular uh, article is endovascular management, specifically using the Nellick system. And as pointed out by the authors, EVAS with Nelix was associated with lower midterm all-cause mortality in the EVAS-1 Nelix IDE trial, but other studies have not confirmed these results. Though the Nelix has now been voluntarily recalled, at least in its first form, and is unavailable in usual clinical practice, the authors propose to explore whether there are any benefits to SAC obliteration, a question that still carries potential implications for AAA management in the longer term. Uh, they propose to accomplish this, um, you know, answer this question by comparing data from EVAS-1 to VQI data. So this study necessarily required two data sources. As you would expect, the patients in EVAS-1 were a much more highly selected group, both in terms of aneurysm anatomy in order to meet IFU and in terms of other conditions that would negatively affect follow-up. Specifically, um, patients with life expectancy less than two years, which is, I think, probably important for these analyses, coagulopathy or an uncontrolled bleeding diagnoses, connective tissue disorders, a uh, stroke or MI within three months, or any other diseases that might interfere with the study were excluded. In both data sets, patients with renal dysfunction were also excluded. You can see that even though uh, the authors were able to match the time period of the VQI data to EVAS-1, there were necessarily some differences in the study locations and follow-up available. The primary outcomes of the study were two and five-year mortality, and the authors considered a number of other factors, including demographics and comorbidities in aneurysm anatomy. Baseline comparisons included chi-squared tests or Fisher exact tests, as well as student T tests, and crude mortality rates were compared at two and five years. In order to make adjusted comparisons, the authors used propensity scores and inverse probability weights. These scores were generated using most of the available baseline variables, including age, race, sex, aortic diameter, surgery year, uh, et cetera. Also, I think of note, um, the presence of one or more iliac aneurysms and uh, a family history of triple A's and smoking status. They constructed Kaplan-Meier curves, which they compared using weighted Cox regressions. Now, given the anatomic variation within the VQI data set, the authors also conducted a sensitivity analysis that included only on IFU patients from VQI. 
And that was to deal with the fact that all patients in EVAS-1 were treated within IFU. The authors also conducted a secondary analysis that repeated the above analyses, but stratified by AAA size with the hypothesis that EVAS-related benefits might be more relevant for larger volume SACs. And then finally, there were a series of analyses that were only possible within the EVAS-1 cohort, including um, causes of death and effects of SAC and thrombus volume on mortality. So it's quite a number of analyses, so let's get started. Uh, the analytic cohort included 333 patients from EVAS-1 and 16,497 control EVAS EVAR patients from BQI. As shown in this table, there were some significant differences between the groups at baseline, though some of these differences, such as follow-up time, AAA diameter, and hypertension rates were relatively minimal. It's also worth noting that anatomic data was missing for most VQI patients. In general, though, EVAS patients were more likely to be male, have familial AAAs, be obese, have uh, PAD or prior PCIs, while EVAR patients were more likely to have um, prior congestive heart failure, uh, CKD, be current or former smokers, and have concomitant iliac aneurysms. Now, this graph is presented as survival, not mortality, but as you can see, it demonstrates a non-significant difference in crude mortality, certainly at two years. Uh, there were no differences in crude or adjusted mortality at five years, but there was a significantly greater hazard for mortality between years two and five in the EVAS group after adjustment, as you can see um, down here with the weighted two to five year mortality. A good minority of EVAS patients and nearly half of EVAR patients were treated for aneurysms smaller than five and a half centimeters. And among this smaller group, EVAS was associated um, with a two and a half times greater uh, hazard, of hazard of mortality at about five years, as you can see here. And then also, again, the hazard um, increase from two to five years is also significant. Among the patients um, who had aneurysms larger than five and a half centimeters, EVAS was associated with the lower hazard of mortality over the first two years, but the curves crossed around four years and EVAS had a higher hazard of mortality, again, between years two and five. When the VQI cohort was limited to patients who had on IFU EVAR, EVAS was associated with significantly higher weighted hazards of mortality at five years in the overall analysis and in smaller aneurysms, and again was associated with a significantly higher hazard of mortality between two and five years in the overall cohort and both, um, both side subgroups. Now, among the analyses that could only be done in the EVAS-1 patients, 53 EVAS-1 patients died during the five-year study period, 15% of which were aneurysm-related. As you can see uh, in the orange part of the graph down here, there's sort of an early peak in aneurysm-related deaths, followed by um, potentially another peak between three and four years after aneurysm repair, while the risk of cardiovascular death in gray remained relatively constant. There was no relation between sac volume and mortality, regardless of how that volume was expressed. Um, and so as you can see here, summing up these findings, EVAS-1 was associated with higher mortality than EVAR along a number of different dimensions, including between two and five years on weighted analysis when compared with on IFU, on IFU EVAR, and also when stratified by size, although there was a, you know, important to point out, a mortality benefit seen in larger aneurysms up to two years. Now, this is a really important study and one that I'm glad we're discussing tonight. Um, and it does add to the ongoing discussion about uh, the management of aneurysm sacs. I think in particular, the authors were able to shed some light on a couple of different hypotheses related to the potential benefits and drawbacks of aneurysm sac obliteration or management, including the potential of reduced inflammation from sac obliteration to reduce mortality, as well as the potential that increased EVAS-related mortality after two years is due to device failure or migration, which could be mitigated in future generations of the device. And you know, within this paper, I think our data to guide discussions about aneurysm sac obliteration as an overall approach to AAAs, regardless of the um, long-term fate of the Nalix device. There are some limitations to the study as acknowledged by the authors, including um, the small size of the EVAS-1 study. 
think it's also worth pointing out that even though the authors attempted to mitigate the differences between the EVAS-1 and VQI patient cohorts with inverse propensity weighting, it's really unlikely that they were able to adjust away the fact that the IDE patients were selected specifically to maximize two-year survival, which might have accounted for um, some of the mortality benefits seen. Why don't we start with a couple of the questions that uh, Paul has placed into the chat. And so um, these will go to Dr. Shimmerhorn and to Dr. Rastogian, and you can start with them and we can go from there. So um, one of the things that he put in there was the introduction mentions inflammation of the SAC following EVAR and a possible relationship to uh, major adverse cardiac events. And so how was this determined? And you can see that he had listed a few things there. What is the mechanism? Um, how does it influence the major adverse cardiac events? And are there differences in systemic inflammatory markers after EVAR and EVAS? And I don't think that was in the trial, but you guys can enlighten us. Oh, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the great uh, presentation. Um, um, yeah, so starting with uh, Dr. Demucio's question, uh, start from the back. Uh, so are there differences in systemic inflammatory markers after EVAR versus EVAS? Um, actually, there has been, uh, that's a great question, and there has been a, a prior literature that uh, demonstrated um, uh, the blunted systemic inflammatory response following EVAS uh, compared with EVAR, um, but there's still a lot of of studies to be done, uh, study to be done uh, uh, to really determine that. Um, and, you know, we know that um, cycle, and what is the mechanism? So how does it, um, how does it reduce? How does it blunt the systemic response? Um, we believe that it has to do with um, the continued pressure on the SAC, which is still, um, which is still there in EVAR uh, with endo leaks. And um, um, yeah, so, uh, which is not there after cycle maturation. Um, but I don't think that that has been proven as of yet. Uh, so that still remains in hypothesis, <laughs> honestly. Um, and how does it influence MACE? Well, we know that inflammation is um, is related to atherothrombosis from formation. Um, there have been prior uh, large trials that have demonstrated um, higher risk of MACE in patients with AAA and uh, after placement of EVAR. Um, so that is, that's, that's how we made the relationship. I'm sure Dr. Sherman would like to add. Sure, there was a, there was a paper in uh, Journal of Endovascular Therapy by uh, Berg um, back like five years ago. And they, they actually compared the uh, inflammatory markers uh, with EVAS patients. There were about 50 or 60 of them and, and EVAR patients. So they had lower, uh, CRP, lower uh, white blood cell count. Um, they had a lower rate of post-inflammatory syndrome. Um, and they also did have uh, fewer uh, uh, cardiac uh, adverse events. Um, I think the, the potential issue with that study was that they used, I think, just PTFE uh, EVARs, and there may be a difference from PTFE compared to Dacron. So it'd be nice to repeat that. Um, comparing the different fabric types too. But I, I think Vernon was right. I think there's this inflammatory response that goes on with the SAC pressurization and even thrombus will transmit pressure. So I think that's why obliteration of the SAC might be better than just allowing SAC thrombosis to decrease that inflammatory response. But, but yeah, we are still awaiting much better data. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more work to be done, but, but it is promising. So, Minamir, one of the other questions that Dr. Kim asked is if there are ongoing trials that are involving this technology. Well, there are two different uh, cyclotrition techniques that are currently being um, that are currently being um, uh, um, tested right now. I think one is the AAA real uh, or um, I don't know the exact names, <laughs> but I know they're being tested in the Netherlands. Um, and so not, not in, um, hopefully with better proximal fixation techniques. Um, but yeah, there are definitely other, other techniques with cycle duration that are being uh, trialed right now. Yeah, Michelle Ryan and, and uh, Andrew Holden are using the shape memory plugs to, uh, you know, 
fill the sack at the end of EVAR and have some very promising results. I mean, they're they're not don't have a difference in in survival, and they're not measuring inflammatory markers. I don't believe, but they are measuring sac regression. And since sac regression has been shown to improve survival or be associated with the improved survival, uh, then that's I think very suggestive. And they do have it's very early, but they have some very promising uh, results. And then um, others. Um, have looked at embolization with coils into the sac and also shown some promising results with that. I mean, and others have embolized branches and, and also had some good results with that. So it remains to be seen whether, you know, obliteration of the sac alone versus sac plus large IMAs or large lumbars um, are, are necessary to, to get that sac regression that we hope will translate to improve survival. I'm going to ask a question that might show my slight geekiness and maybe some of my just misunderstanding of, of some of the, the charts here. But on um, figure, on the all-cause mortality for aneurysms di diameters less than 5.5. So it's a significant value, but the lines cross. So that means that the proportional hazards are not the same over time. And you're looking at a five-year difference here. So you're getting significance, but that means that there's probably a, a difference. And what you see at the end of the curve is this big separation versus where they're similar and cross in the middle of the curve. So this late kind of mortality that we see with this EVAS device, do you have thoughts on that? Well, we have seen that the graph failure has mainly been has mainly started after uh, three years, um, and I think that's the translation that we're seeing in this paper, uh, which we didn't see in the prior paper, uh, which was published before. Uh, that after three years, you see a rapid, a more rapid decline of the all-cause mortality uh, following EVAS, uh, which we. Hypothesize is due to graph failure, but we are uncertain, of course, remain uncertain due to the retrospective nature of this data. Do you think it may be because those patients are younger too? And so now they're in, I don't know, there's just looking at the difference between the patients too, was my other thought. Yeah, probably, possibly, definitely. Yeah. And then, uh, Mark, did you answer this question about how long did the inflammatory state last? Or... They only measured uh, uh, early. I don't think there have been any studies that looked at the duration. Um, there was a, a study, I, I think, that was presented at the uh, VEF meeting, but it, it and but that one also I don't think went out very long, where they were measuring inflammatory markers like on a daily basis for like a week or two, and they definitely showed a difference throughout that entire period. Um, but uh, I don't think it was any longer than, you know, like I say, a week or two. So, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to to do a study and, and to measure these inflammatory markers uh, longer term to see if that's for real. I mean, other people have looked, uh, thought about, or, or some people are doing it, looking at PET CT. That's an expensive way to, to measure this, but to look at the inflammatory activity in the aortic wall uh, after EVAR and then compare that between uh, different graphs. I think that would be really interesting too, but pretty expensive. I don't, I've, I've not necessarily looked at that. Have they seen differences between some of the different graphs? I'm not aware of anybody doing any kind of comparative work. I think that, okay. and I don't think that, I'm, I'm not aware of anything being published either. I've just heard that, you know, some people have uh, uh, thought about this and have done it, you know, are doing it on some of their patients, um, but uh, nothing that I'm aware of has been presented anywhere or published. I, I sometimes I get excited and like to spend money in the name of research too, so <laughs> I can understand how that goes. I had this idea and we're going we're gonna to try it, so. Exactly, we just need um, somebody to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, other questions from the audience that, that people have about this this paper? If not, if anyone wants to put that in there, I'll give it a second. I can drag this out as long as possible. But we will let Dr. Briggs bring up his presentation and we can um, um, move on to our next paper. And uh, Venmar, thank you for joining us from the Netherlands and we appreciate it. So. Thank you for having us. No,
Well, thank you very much. So I, I can go ahead and start, Ms. T, or do you want me to wait a minute? No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Fantastic. Everybody can see that okay? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So this is the March 2023 Journal Club. A uh, very uh, big thank you to Drs. Forbes and Dahlman, Misty and Paul, of course, uh, Dr. Dua, who's on the line tonight, Dr. Brent Robertson and Dr. Muck, and then the SPS. Chronic venous disease affects millions of people worldwide, as we all know. Traditional therapies uh, sometimes help, uh, but uh, obstructive lesions, unfortunately, the iliac vein cause more severe symptoms. One mechanism of iliofemoral venous outflow obstruction is non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions. Uh, the underlying pathology in these patients is extraluminal venous compression with secondary band or web formation, frequently uh, associated with a compression of the overlying right iliac artery and May-Thurner syndrome, but sometimes associated with these other pathologies. Alternatively, post-thrombotic venous stenosis has been identified as the cause of iliofemoral venous outflow obstruction as a result of residual intraluminal irregularity associated with previous DVT, and this unfortunately serves as a nidus for future intraluminal obstruction. Uh, it's been estimated that 20 to 50 percent of patients with iliofemoral DVT will develop post-thrombotic syndrome as a result of venous hypertension uh, without clot removal. Uh, the constellation of symptoms in patients with chronic venous disease includes uh, edema, erythema, hyperpigmentation, lipodermatic sclerosis, and can progress to recurrent cellulitis and ulceration. And because of that, the SVS and the American Venus Forum published guidelines in 2014 recommending venous stenting for patients with a SEEP score of C4B5 or 6, which includes lipodermatosclerosis, field ulceration, and active ulceration, effectively. With venous stent selection, venous interventionalists, vascular surgeons use multiplanar venography and IVUS to guide appropriate stent selection in patients with, excuse me, with long segments of disease and post-thrombotic patients, more than one stent is usually, usually required, and this also accounts for a sufficient overlap between the stents. IVUS is typically used to determine the landing zones cranially and caudally with the goal of stenting from healthy to healthy vessel, uh, and IVUS is generally considered to be the gold standard imaging technique in treatment of venous disease. Uh, Dr. Uh, Raju argues that the optimal stent sizes in the common iliac, external iliac, and common ephemeral vein segments are 16, 14, and 12, and that stent correction of iliac vein stenosis should aim to restore the lumen to the minimum recommended caliber during the initial procedure and later reinterventions. Stent sizing, on the other hand, is a little bit more controversial in non-thrombotic lesions, and this is critically important because the majority of stent migration cases tend to occur in these clinical scenarios. Significant size mismatch between the short reduction in common iliac vein cross-sectional area at the point of compression with dilated vein caudal to the compression point is a, a landmark or a trademark. Strategies to maximize wall lap position typically include either selecting a shorter stent appropriate for the dilated common iliac vein caudal to the stenosis or extending a smaller, a smaller caliber stent into the external iliac past the curve of the pelvis with most practitioners oversizing their stent by one to two millimeters as determined by IVUS. Theoretically, and in the arterial and hemodialysis realms, stent length is an impediment to flow as it increases resistance in a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and there is concern that longer lesion length venous stents may be more prone to thrombosis. On the other hand, placement of a short length venous stent does carry the potentially catastrophic complication of stent migration. Uh, so what is the ideal stent length and does the effective stent length affect patency? Uh, tonight's study evaluates the association between stent length and six-month patency for patients treated for iliofemoral venous outflow obstruction. Uh, the authors note that there is a paucity of data available regarding the effect of stent length on patency rates after intervention. Our article tonight we printed, presented by our first-year fellow, Dr. Dale Coffey, uh, who came to us from New Hanover Medical Center in Wilmington, North Carolina. Thank you, Dr. Briggs. Let me just put the share screen. Can everybody see this okay? All right. So as Dr. Briggs uh, mentioned, I am presenting this paper uh, entitled Venus Stent Patency 
uh, is independent of total stinted length in non-thrombotic iliac vein and post-thrombotic venous stenosis by Dr. Robertson and his team. Um, and not to belabor this point because Dr. Briggs did a pretty good, great job of introducing this, but in terms of iliofemoral venous outflow obstruction, it can be divided into uh, two separate entities, uh, looking at non-thrombotic and post-thrombotic uh, venous stenosis. So non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, as Dr. Briggs mentioned, is secondary to extraluminal venous compression, like we see in May-Thurner syndrome or some other uh, tumor or uh, radiation-induced uh, fibrosis. And whereas post-thrombotic venous stenosis um, can occur uh, secondary to intraluminal uh, narrowing after a uh, deep venous thrombosis. And like Dr. Briggs mentioned, 20 to 50% of these patients with iliofemoral DVT will develop post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, so in today's day and age, venous stenting is the preferred management for symptomatic outflow obstruction uh, with the main um, problem at hand being the, uh, the length um, of the stent as shorter stent lengths, uh, especially less than 100 millimeters have carried with it a risk of migration as Dr. Briggs alluded to, uh, while longer segment stenting may increase risk of thrombosis. And this is the question that the authors in this study uh, sought to answer. So. This was a retrospective analysis uh, of 161 patients who underwent iliofemoral venous stenting uh, from the years 2016 to 2021. It was a multi-institutional study at two institutions um, and it included patients with non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, post-thrombotic uh, stenoses, as well as acute DVTs uh, with outflow obstruction. These were all confirmed by uh, either venous duplex, CT venogram, or IVIS, or a combination thereof. Um, there was general demographic patient data that was collected, including gender, age, uh, BMI, uh, thrombophilia, and a history of DVT in their SEEP score. Uh, as far as the patient characteristics, um, the authors did a really great job of outlining that these were all lifestyle limiting symptoms and that they had previously failed conservative therapy. Um, and then in terms of these chronic venous insufficiency patients, all of these had uh, undergone previous treatment of their superficial venous reflux if, they were, uh, if it was applicable to them. Um, as far as the procedural characteristics, they were outlined very well as, as well. Um, as far as non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion access, uh, we were, they accessed from the femoral. And as far as post-thrombotic or acute DVT, these were accessed from the popliteal, small saphenous, or high posterior tibial veins. Uh, acute DVTs were treated with pharmacomechanical thrombectomy with or without lysis uh, prior to stenting. And IVIS was used in all cases pre and post intervention to confirm successful placement of stent. And stents were only placed if a greater than 50% area reduction uh, was observed with IVIS. Uh, more procedural characteristics that were outlined by the authors include that they uh, did pre and post dilatation uh, performed with uh, non-compliant atlas balloons. Um, Self-expanding stents were exclusively used. Uh, they did note that at the beginning of the trial, um, they were using uh, wall stents, venous wall stents until FDA approval of uh, exclusively venous stents were approved and then transitioned primarily to the Novo stents. Uh, as a general rule, the stents were oversized by one to two millimeters when placed and with uh, greater than or equal to one centimeter of overlap when more than one stent was required. Uh, the inflow disease, if there was femoral popliteal inflow disease, this was managed with stenting across the inguinal ligament into the common femoral vein without ex extension into the femoral or the deep femoral vein. And as far as their post-procedure anticoagulation or anti-platelet management is concerned, uh, individuals with uh, non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions uh, were placed on Plavix monotherapy for six months, whereas those that were um, a victim of thromb thrombotic disease were transitioned to a DOAC, either <clears throat> Zarelto or Eliquis. Uh, they were all seen at follow-up six months um, with a history and physical and a duplex to confirm stent patency. I think it's important to note in this study that patency was defined as the absence of complete occlusion 
um, and that the degree of stenosis was not necessarily evaluated. Ultimately, looking at general patient characteristics of this population, um, after follow-up, 108 of the 161 patients that were originally stented followed up at six months um, with a mean age of 55.6 years, and 58.3% of these were female uh, with 10% history of thrombophilia, uh, and 57% uh, with a SEEP score of C4B to C6. Regarding the overall stent patency, uh, at six months, there was nearly a 90% overall stent patency. When looking at the stent lengths, the stent, total stent length group less than 100 millimeters um, had a stent patency of 92.9%, whereas greater than 100 millimeters was 86.5%. While there's a difference here, this, did, this was not statistically significant with a p-value of 0.22, as you see below. Um, and then looking at the other disease process groups, uh, the non-obstructive iliac vein lesions uh, had a 98% patency, whereas those with thrombotic disease uh, had an 85 and an 86% patency. Uh, just some more general data coming, um, coming from the results. Two stents were required in 49 patients. So the vast majority of patients were actually treated with one stent. Um, and then 27 patients had stents that extended below the inguinal ligament. Um, and the patency of these patients that had stents below their inguinal ligament had a patency of 85%, which was comparable to the uh, thrombotic groups seen in the, um, the other results. And now looking at the post-thrombotic and DVT patients uh, as groups uh, 10 of these 67 patients actually lost patency during the six month interval. Um, four of these in the acute DVT group, while six of these in the post thrombotic arm. Uh, the four in the acute DVT group, it was important to note that two of them were non compliant with anticoagulation. And the six in the post thrombotic arm all had evidence of femoral popliteal inflow disease. Um, and the inflow disease in this study was defined as the presence of uh, small caliber vessels with uh, post thrombotic changes that were apparent on venography and IVIS. And this required uh, stenting across the inguinal ligament in order to uh, treat this and get back down to normal vessel. Uh, the others that failed, one required cessation of anticoagulation for surgery while another was non-compliant. Um, and then three of them also had concomitant chronic iliocable venous obstruction. Uh, with an occluded IVC filter that required recanalization. And all three of these patients actually had a history significant for factor V Leiden. So it was a difficult situation to begin with. And of note, uh, there were seven patients in the study that had a similar uh, issue where they had an occluded IVC filter that required recanalization prior to stenting. Um, three of those seven patients failed, the three you see here, and the four that remained patent did not have a hypercoagulable disorder as these did. So in conclusion, um, the authors would suggest that this data uh, would uh, suggest that the total stented length in the iliofemoral venous outflow tract does not necessarily impact venous stent patency at a six month interval follow-up. And that should lead us to aim to stent from normal to normal or healthy to healthy vein uh, to avoid stent migration as short segment stents less than 100 millimeters, the vast majority of these are the ones that are responsible for stent migration. And a lot of the data especially uh, may suggest that the disease process is likely a much more significant factor than stent length in determining patency. Um, and a subgroup analysis of this data actually suggests that uh, thrombophilia and the presence of thrombotic disease, as well as adherence to anticoagulation therapy are uh, much more significant factors uh, than stent length itself. And that is the conclusion of that presentation. So if anybody would like to start the discussion. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Anaita Dua. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at MGH and I'll be um, leading this discussion. Really, This is such a fantastic uh, manuscript. Um, I wanna ask a couple of questions about the anticoagulation part of it um, because it's interesting, you know, you said Plavix only and I know that that is, um, 
uh, what you know the reps also say for these these patients. But um, in this patient group, do you feel that that's sufficient, um, or do you think that potentially, if all of these patients had been, for example, anticoagulated for six months and then gone on to just Plavix or something of that nature, do you think that would have changed these results, or do you really think it's the mechanics of being healthy to healthy? Because of course that means that you'd have to go really into the IVC, right? If you had like a May Thurner type situation right at the takeoff. Brent, go ahead. Yeah, so um, thanks for your question and, and good job presenting that paper. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I think uh, more important than that is really the etiology of where the disease came from. So um, in the post-thrombotic group, you know, although the, the raw percentages was lower in, in comparison um, with the less than 100 millimeter versus greater than 100 millimeter, the longer stent length, in that long stent length group, about 50% of them were actually in the post-thrombotic group, which says there's a lot uh, to do with patency as, as far as uh, whether it's thrombotic in nature or not. So um, given that, I think that the, the more important part of that is uh, the disease and trying to go from normal to normal. Um, you know, if it's uh, for the non-thrombotic group, Plavix monotherapy uh, with still having good results there, I think uh, was adequate in our cohort. And I think that Plavix for that rather than um, anticoagulation uh, would, would be just fine. And then for the, um, for the, for the post-thrombotic group with the DOAX, um, you know, in general, I think there's some discussion about uh, people using Lovenox and then switching to a DOAC or just going to a DOAC, but um, you know, just being on a DOAC uh, for for those I think is more important than having to do it for the non-thrombotic group. So it really more comes down to what the etiology of disease is that you're treating. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, piggyback. Dr. Ait has asked a question here um, to just describe how far the stents uh, extend into the IVC. And I'll also add to that, I was going to ask distally, um, how far are the stents going into the common femoral? Do you think that that makes any difference um, in terms of outcomes? Yeah, I can take that, Brent, if you like. So first of all, Paul and Misty, thanks so much. And, and Dale and Charles, thanks for an awesome job. And finally, really hats off to Brent. This is from our institution, but Brent is a workhorse. He won multiple awards during his final uh, year in our integrated program and, and just did an incredible job. And I, he, the way I look at Brent as a graduate is really the next generation of, of vascular surgeons. You know, he's liable to do a PMEG, Chivar, TGAR, rupture AAA, and DVT, PE, and venous stent all in one week. And I think that's the future for, for our specialty. I think we really need to embrace venous disease. Um, as far as John's question, that's a, a great question. And what we've learned is that, uh, especially with the dedicated venous stents, without a doubt, you wanna place it right on the iliocable confluence. You don't wanna jail the contralateral unaffected common iliac vein. And early on, um, I think admittedly, we were a little gun shy across the inguinal ligament. But now we know from the Abre data, we know from the Zilver v, uh, Vena uh, data, as well as your, our own data that you saw that in the 27 patients, when we crossed the inguinal lig ligament, mainly with the Venovo, the patency was well, uh, really uh, uh, well achieved. So I think the, the principles, like Brent said, are inflow, outflow, and conduit, and, and, and you know, don't be afraid to extend down to the common femoral vein. So in this patient population now, based on the study that you've done, do you think that when you're talking about, for example, normal vein, is there any particular way that you could decide that this is indeed normal besides a venogram? Like, are you using IVIS to see, is there anything, you know, on the, the body of the wall? Like, how do you say this is normal vein that I'm stenting into? Yeah, so I think IVIS being the gold standard for all these venous procedures is uh, really one of the best ways to look at it. You know, of course, we use multiplanar venography as well, but using IVIS really lets you know, um, you know, what the diameter and the area is according to what it probably should be in those segments from the common iliac down to the common femoral. And then the IVIS really lets you see if there's any, um, you know, trabeculae within the lumen of the vein, if there's any scar tissue and exactly where the luminal changes are. So using IVIS, I think, is really important to identify where your healthy segment actually starts and ends. Excellent. And so if you had a patient that had 
an area that has, you know, chronic disease that ultimately thrombosis off, and then you've got some acute clot. So let's say you remove the acute clot and then you put ibis in, and essentially the, the wall of the vein looks okay, but you know that there was originally thrombus there. Would you stent into that and say we're good? Um, or are you talking about just vein that's been untouched? Um, because I'm just thinking about how far you'd really need to go, you know, um, in terms of the stent. And it makes total sense, normal to normal. But again, how do you define that normal? Right. So if, if you're talking about um, a like a stent thrombosis situation after the fact, so in that sense, you know, if you're able to use your adjunctive measures, whether it's the mechanical thrombectomy or catheter lysis, once you use the IVIS after that, after you cleared the clot, if the segment that that uh, seemed to be problematic was, you know, uh, distal to that lower down towards the common femoral, that suggests that maybe there was an inflow problem even, whether it was from the femoral or the profunda. So if um, if you have room to extend the stent farther down into the common femoral to cover the, the part that was affected, then I think that would be the, the option there. Let me ask you a, a question just related now to arterial side of this. So obviously, you know, in arterial work, a lot of a lot of us just do the spot stenting. So you know, you might recanalize a big CTO, and then you do a DCB. Oh, it looks all right. Maybe just to do a spot stent. Would you? I mean, obviously, you're talking about different um, mechanics of even the artery versus the vein. But why do you think that you found this finding where the more stent and healthy to healthy works for venous? But we know if you do a long segment, you really try to do healthy to healthy in arterial, you a lot of times end up with thrombosis. I, I, I can take that. I think that, you know, what we're, what we're learning and what this paper, admittedly, we still have a long way to go, the difference between our paper and Mark's and paper at the start of the hour, which was awesome, was obviously retrospective, limited numbers. You know, we're looking to enroll in the VQI Venice, uh, Venus Stent uh, Registry ASAP. But I think what it shows is anecdotally, the, the longer the stent the better it's going to lock into the external iliac and it's a more gentle bend perhaps with better flow dynamics but the offshoot of that is if you look at the mod database and folks who do a lot of venous interventions uh, know that in the mod database it is loaded with um, uh, small length stents that migrated northbound just like charles showed in his picture if i if i remember and so the offshoot of this is that Longer is better to lock into the external iliac because all the stents in the uh, MAUD database were 60 or less or 80 and nothing was uh, greater than 100 that migrated northbound. So I think that, you know, that was kind of hard to highlight in the paper, but the companies are definitely uh, excited that this paper worked out the way it did <laughs> statistically because that's what they want is they want longer stents, lock it into the external iliac and minimize uh, migration northbound. So again, Brent did an incredible job with this and really uh, is a workhorse. Do you think there's anything to be said about, and I know not, no one really knows the answer, but the design of the stents themselves, because I saw your, you know, your time period traversed a number of years where we had all kinds of stents hitting the market, you know, and is it possible that that might be what, you know, you're really seeing versus um, actually, it was just the length. From, I'm, I'm just a, making conversation about it. Yeah, I can answer that. Brent won't brag on himself, but he also had a paper at the American Venus Forum the year before comparing wall stent and Finovo. And mm -hmm. wall stent's an excellent stent as well. And so they're essentially equal. So I don't know how you look at it. Do you look at Finovo is, is just as good as the gold standard? And uh, or is should we go back to wall stent? I think most of us know with the wall stent, the radial strength at the edges is not good. And oftentimes you had to cover the contralateral iliac. So I think the, the principle is just like Brent said, is that based on IVUS, you go normal to no, normal based on your IVUS and all the available stents that are out there work quite well. And I have two questions from the audience here. Uh, the first one being, um, I know this is an observation study basically between the groups, but did you do any type of power calculation to determine the number of patients per group or anything of that nature for statistical analysis? No, we did not. Oh, go ahead. I was saying, uh, no, we, we didn't turn, we didn't do that to determine the, the statistical analysis in terms of each patient per group. And I think the fact that um, number one, it's a pretty uh, small cohort overall. And the fact that number two, it's only a six month study, um, obviously there's, there's limitations. So there'll be more data going forward, but 
as far as, um, you know, for a, for a type two error, as far as the, the number of patients go, you know, with, with us only having limited data, because venous stenting is, um, unfortunately doesn't have a whole lot of data behind it, but will going forward, you know, I, I think it's to be expected that there's definitely potential for some type two error. And so a larger cohort would, would help clear that up. And hopefully we'll be able to um, continue to progress forward over time with more patients. And, um, you know, we'd love to uh, soon be able to enroll in the uh, VQI venous stent module as well. Um, and then there's a question from Dr. Humphreys here saying, uh, do you think that there's an ideal location to overlap the iliac stents? Um, would it be potentially in the common versus the external? If you could choose a landing zone, what would you choose? Yeah, I, I think that that's a great question. I'd probably answer it a different way. What's a not ideal location? And I would say if you're crossing the inguinal ligament, you really don't want at that area to, two stents overlapping. Short of that, I, I think in an ideal world, you'd have a, a tapered stent. I maybe we'll get there some, someday here in, in the States. And, you know, in our hands and what Brent's study showed is that the most commonly deployed stent, at least in the Midwest here in Cincinnati, was a 14 by 120, which typically locks you into the external iliac. But I think if you had to to, to overlap, I see what Brent has to say, but I, I would think you would want to overlap in the common where it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, I agree. The so last question, I think, to end the evening, because it'll be uh, nine o'clock, um, just kind of futuristic thinking, you know, we've got uh, drug coded stents for the arterial disease, you know, to try to prevent instant stenosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in this group of patients in venous stenting, do you think there'd be any utility to bonding heparin or something like that within a stent or having a, a you know, biodegradable internal scaffold or something like that that may potentially... Um, stop these stents from thrombosing versus just the mechanics of it in location? Anything like that in your mind? I can tell you that Medtronic uh, is looking at a stent coated with an anti-inflammatory type coating, and I think that's probably more where it's going to go as opposed to heparin bonded or a DCB, because a lot of these stents, they get layering, as we know, and that's why our definition that, that Brent, that we chose was, you know, whether the stent was open or not, it's hard to judge a stenosis, so, you know, cause you get layering and some of it's thrombus, some of it's fibrin, some of it's platelet aggregates, I don't know. So I think the ultimate goal is a, uh, a coating that's uh, anti-inflammatory. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Paul and Misty. Great job, that was a fantastic uh, paper. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for both of our host institutions um, from Duke and from Atrium Health. Um, our moderators, although Dr. Rasmussen didn't make it, um, thank you, Dr. Dua, for taking over and to our author groups um, for being here to go over the work. It's one of the greatest things that really helps with you know, thinking about research and especially for the younger people that are here, planning their research, understanding the nuances of research. So we're always grateful to have everybody. And then of course, Dr. Domins and Dr. Forbes for being here. Um, we will be back in April, April uh, 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern. You never know what kind of excitement there may be at the JVS <laughs> Journal Club. So feel free to come on back in April and we'll see you then. Have yeah. a great night. Thank you, Misty. And uh, again, apologize that you guys had to um, suffer yeah. the idiocy. But, uh, yes. Ah, don't worry. It was hilarious. <laughs> it's fine. Everyone was laughing. I don't understand. So people intense. don't Are you have kidding me. <laughs> really, like people don't have better things to do than come into a vascular surgery. Like get get a life. <laughs> it must be more important than uh, we think. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> they're pissed about insurance. <laughs> yeah. Good night, everybody, and look out uh, for future events. Like uh, Misty said, thank you again, all. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye.